Hello and welcome to another edition of WNS Operative Grand Rounds. And uh, today we're very fortunate again to be joined by Dr. David Jimenez, who's the professor and chairman of neurosurgery at University of Texas San Antonio. And as all of you know, Dr. Jimenez is really the uh, creator of many of the surgical procedures that we'll see today and uh, has uh, been writing extensively on these topics now for, for many years. So we're, we're very privileged again to be joined by him as he takes us through the next set of craniosynostosis topics here in part two of our craniosynostosis series. And uh, this time we'll be focusing on metopic and lambdoid synostosis. So Dr. Jimenez, thank you again. Cora, right, thank you very much. Um, I will also like to disclose that um, this work has been done in conjunction with Dr. Baroni, the plastic surgeon whom I've worked with for the past 27 years, and has come up with uh, a lot of the inspiration for what we're doing. So today I would like to talk to you about the management of both metopic and lambdoid synastosis. We've already talked about sagittal and coronal, and in those videos I described the instrumentation and some of the basic principles. I'll, I'll concentrate on some of the results. We've uh, operated uh, so far a total of 127 metopic synastoses. So it's a pretty good number of patients over the past 17 years. In, in this case, what you can see here is that uh, the patients typically do have severe trigonal cephaly. I want to make a point that we do not operate on metopic ridges. Thank you very much. Uh, when you say you don't operate on metopic ridges, that, uh, that of course, uh, is something that we would all subscribe to. But how, when does a metopic ridge become metopic synostosis for you? Are there objective criteria that you look at for, for making that surgical determination? Well, I think technically all metopic ridges are metopic cranial synostosis because that, that is what happens. The question in my mind, or at least in our mind, is when does that take place? Uh, somewhere, if, if a metopic synastosis develops later in life, meaning, you know, five, six, seven, eight months of age, on, who, on a child that otherwise was normal, then it becomes a metopic ridge. But clinically, I don't think it's significant. All the patient has is a little bump somewhere up in, here, in this area, but when you look at the child from above, the shape of the forehead is not trigonal cephalic. It's nice and round. When you look at their eyes, they're not hypotelloric. They don't look pinched in, and, uh, and other than perhaps a little visible ridge, you have a, a, a totally normal child. Where we believe that the clinically significant metopic synastosis is when most of these happen in utero anyway, and the child is born with the synastosis, and these kids show up like you see the, this child in, in, in this slide. Significant hypotelorism, the eyes are moved in the middle, significant trigonocephaly, and quite a bit of compression on the frontal bones. And this, this illustration here is to uh, let you know that the concept is simply to do a metopic suture, suturectomy extending from the anterior fontanelle all the way down to the nasofrontal suture. But we must reach the nasopharnal suture. Leaving any bone up in here will defeat the purpose of the operation. Uh, following, and this is about the location of the incisions, we make it right behind the hairline and usually in front of the anterior fontanelle. It usually measures about two centimeters in size and in length. And then um, this is followed by the placement of specially custom made orthotic helmets, which again will put pressure right here, some pressure here, pressure, not really pressure, but containment, and then leave an extra space right in this area, both on the front side, which then allows the brain to grow in this direction, fill in, and obtain a normal round forehead. Now I would like to go into a surgical video to show you the exact uh, operation and, and how it is done. This uh, video demonstrates, first of all, we'll, we'll start with the instrumentation. As I mentioned previously, we like to keep them simple. And almost all that we use is contained in, in a male stand right there. 
Uh, this is an electric rasper that has become very useful.